All right. Well, good afternoon, Asaf. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited for us to have our conversation today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, you know, we connected over Lunch Club, which I thought, you know, was awesome. And I know that you've been on Lunch Club for a while. So can you tell people maybe a little bit more about, you know, what you do and sort of how you leverage Lunch Club? Yeah. So first of all, uh, um, we should give a lot of respect and a shout out to Lunch Clubs. So this, this is where we're met. Uh, so um, I've been lunch clubbing for a while. Um, I remember doing it when it was literally meeting and not just like this for COVID. And so, yeah, so that's where we met and we had an awesome meeting. So thanks for having me again. My name is Asaf Luxembourg. Uh, I am from Israel. And my big passion in life is basically to share the real story and the face of where I'm from. I have this bug and that's what I'm really obsessed about. Um, when I was young, I thought I'm going to be an ambassador because of that bug. And I spent most of my 20s preparing myself for the big war, which is going to be a diplomat. So I went to study the right things and I went to get the right internships or the right jobs. And as you can see, I am not an ambassador. So my plan failed, but I did end up starting my own business, which is the mechanism that allows me to to do what I'm passionate about. So I guess you can say I'm an entrepreneur, uh, freelancer, I have my own business. Um, I do mainly three things. Number one, I'm a content provider. Um, and some people say like a startup nation ambassador. Israel is very known for tech and startups and entrepreneurship. So uh, that's part of what I do. Um, another thing that I do is I'm a marketing consultant. I'm a partner in a uh, in an agency called Plus972. Um, and the third thing that keeps me busy is that I help a lot of young professionals take lessons from the world of business entrepreneurship and innovation and all that into the world of career building and personal development. I love it. I love also how succinctly you're able to put it all together. And I think one of the things I really enjoyed about our initial conversation was you talking through that pivot. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you came to recognize that you could still have an impact beyond being sort of in a more political role? Yeah, yeah I don't know why people always say that it's the 30 year old crisis, but for me, it was a 30 year old crisis. So I guess I'm the typical you know, person in the middle of the bell shaped curve. Um, when I was 30 years old, um, I mean, to be a diplomat in most countries, you have to apply for the cadet course. It's government job. It may be, some people would say the least entrepreneurial place maybe, because it's, you know, being a public servant. Um, and I tried to apply for a specific program that I wanted to get into. I tried twice. Uh, two times I didn't get in. Um, the first time was merely technical. The second time I just didn't get in. And the second time I was, I was 30 and that really, you know, broke me. So I felt like I lost my professional destiny in life because um, I knew I can't wait two more years for the next round. That's the story I told myself. Um, but in that time, I already did, did a lot of work on the side. So throughout my 20s, my state of mind was I need to prepare for the flight academy. I'm going to put myself on flight courses. I'm going to have more flight hours maybe than the instructors. I'm going to get as much field experience as possible. So I was doing a lot of things on the side, many times for free. Um, and when I didn't get into the cadet course when I was 30, I was broken and I said, okay, enough. Like I need to rethink my life basically. Um, and people kept asking me for more services, more speaking engagements, more seminars, more consulting. And I kind of said, but, but why? Like, no. And for a while I ran away from that destiny. I didn't want to start my own business because it felt to me like a failure like admitting that I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to be the thing that I want it to be. And then a wise woman told me um, that 
instead of focusing on the North Star, I need to understand that the North Star is just the direction for the North direction. Um, and then I said, you know, if the universe is trying to tell me something, then I'm going to go with it. Um, I didn't have a strategic plan. I didn't have a 10-year vision. I just knew what I'm passionate about doing. I didn't know how I'm going to do it. Um, and I'm still on my way in a way. So, but that's how it happened. I love that. And it, you know, a lot of what you just shared very much resonates with me as well. Um, if I think about my story and how I started, it honestly was on a whim. I just very much was like, okay, I don't want to work for anybody else. So I'm going to try this. And, you know, it's been what, this is two coming into my third year of just trying it and trying to see what works and trying to see uh, what sticks. So that's, yeah, that's, that's very much something that resonates. And, you know, it's funny, we're from different places. We're more or less the same age, I assume. Um, but I started seeing something that is bigger than me and my story. Um, I don't want to say that it's generational. It's more like the, the spirit of the times, because mm -hmm. I think it happens to 40 and 50 year olds as well. How did we get to a place where becoming an independent freelancer becomes the way to achieve stability? I mean, how did we get from a world where you study the profession and work in the profession, as a colleague of mine in Israel says, like you, we were sold on that chart, you know, study it, work in it, um, or I don't know which direction it is for you, but this way, I mean, study law, become a lawyer, study finance, become an accountant, study marketing, become a marketer, you know, whatever it was. And then you go out there and suddenly, you know, the rules of the game changed. I, did, I was not aware of it when it happened to me. I guess I'm a millennial in the upper edge. I was born late 84. But the rules of the game changed. I mean, today switching jobs every two, three years is the norm. Mm -hmm. Because you can't keep a job. It's not because you didn't find the right employer. Your employees are changing every two years. It's not because you're a bad leader. It's just the new rules of the game. And then it hit me that, you know, there's a new world out there and it's a, it's a different set of rules. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, once again, I'm just, as you can see, I just nod my head because I actually went to school to be an urban planner. I literally have a master's degree in city planning and I've never practiced as a planner. Right. Um, so very much understand like this idea of what you go to school for is what you need to actually do in life. And I think more people are recognizing that, you know, you can translate some of those same skills into other opportunities and very much. Absolutely. To yeah. yeah. Look, I studied political science and economics. It was clear to me on the first lesson of the first course in the first semester of the first year of economics that I'm not going to be an economist. And it's not an easy degree to finish at Hebrew University. But the funny thing is, I, I do find myself using a lot of the things that I acquired through my academic studies it's kind of like a gladiator's school they teach you how to fight you know how to hold a shield how to fight with a sword how to shoot a, you know an arrow whatever it is but they don't tell you who to fight and where they just teach you how and i think a lot of people me too you know we grew up with this idea that we're going to study in the university and that's going to solve the problem for us for finding the career path it's as if we're buying a solution and that, then it hit me that the rules of the game really changed. And that's how I got into the whole new world of work, which is what we discussed in the lunch club uh, meeting and, you know, would be happy to share here. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about it. And I love, cause you even shared, I think a video with me to help people sort of shift their perceptions on what their role is really as an employee. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So that took time. It's not like, you know, I had this Eureka and, uh, you know, I saw the light or something like that. It happened through time. Um, so what happened is, look, I was lucky. I was there when the story of Israel's startup success exploded. Because in reality, it, it was since the late 90s. But in 2008, I think the book Startup Nation came out and then it really exploded. Everybody were talking about it. Boatload of delegations started coming here. And I was kind of there. I was 25 years old. I was working in the government. I wanted to be an ambassador. So I started getting these opportunities to speak to group and do all these things. So I studied this field of innovation and entrepreneurship, not because I wanted to be in the startup universe, but because it was my way to sell Israel. Again, this is my tangent point. And what happened is that as my story 
you know, as my journey progressed and new generations, you know, I started seeing that their mind is, you know, they think a little different. Their focus is on different things. You know, times change. And then I realized that there are a lot of lessons from the world of startups and entrepreneurship and like business wisdom that is actually very relevant to personal development and career development. And I started organizing like a lot of thoughts. I do a lot of work with young professionals who come to Israel from different countries. So helping them, you know, get settled here and find their path. So immig immigrants uh, or Olim, as we say it here in Israel. Um, and then I started connecting dots. And for something like two, three years, I started, you know, baking those thoughts. Um, and at some point I started writing about it in a blog that I think nobody read. Um, and it helped me curate thoughts. And then I wanted to stay humble. So I didn't say, you know, I have a new methodology or I have a new curriculum or I have a new hack or whatever. I have a certain approach not because I'm an expert, not a coach, not a psychologist, not a career um, guide. The way I, I put it is, you know, I'm a Bedouin, you know, a nomad in the desert. And I just happened to spend time with other Bedouins. So I kind of studied like trends of the desert, but I'm not a sand researcher. And then I started to put it out there and it started to like gain traction. And today it's, it's a big part of what I communicate to my environment and to my community, how to take lessons from the business world and uh, um, um, exercise them on yourself as an individual. Yeah. So let's let's start at the beginning. What what is something you know, you know, if you're thinking about the top three things that you love to communicate or share um, in your speeches or in your workshops, what are some of the things that people should keep in mind in terms of their career? Okay, so, so to, to, to bring it down to earth, like the main three messages, I think number one, you're not the customer. Uh, we were all born, I think, um, into a consumption-driven world, and we think like clients. So if I need to be extreme about how I communicate it, like you don't like your boyfriend, buy a new one. You don't like your car, buy a new one. You don't like your, I don't know, your life, get a new one. You don't like your friends, get a new one. You don't like your job, get a new job. But as you can see, some things are not consumption products or services. These are, you know, investment products. I mean, what, what you invest is what you have. You can't buy a career. Um, so number one is you're not the client. And a lot of people are looking for solutions meaning they want to buy their way out. I am looking for that job that will make me feel happy and be meaningful and be a part of something. And I'm not, I don't want to earn too much. I just want to earn decent, but I want this and this, and that. but it's not about what you want. So number one, you're not the client. Number two, so what are you? The way I frame it, you're the CEO of you. You could be an employee in the corporation your entire life and have a successful and meaningful career. but the way to get there in today's rules of the game, I believe, is you need to think as if you are the CEO of Aqua and whoever's watching, you are the CEO of you, which means that your boss is not your army commander that tells you what to do. Your boss is the customer. Now, everybody who's been in the business world, what do you do with customers? You need to understand what do they want, what do they need, how to serve them, and not only give a good service or product, how to make sure they're satisfied. So they want to buy more of you. So the way to get promoted is not check, 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 and do it faster and ask for promotion. The way to get promoted is find out new realms of pain, solve them, and expand your influence to your clients, your boss or your, you know, the executives or the company. That's how you get promoted. Sell more. So there are many ways of how to interpret this, but I would say, number one, you're not the client. Number two, think like a business unit as the CEO of you. Um, number three, when you think like the CEO of you, behave as if you're a business. What is your strategy? What do you want to get? If you don't communicate that to your boss, your boss will not know. They need to know. 
You can't wait for a career path from them. You need to tell them which career path you want. If you don't know what you want, communicate that you're not sure what you want. But behave as if you're a service provider in the market. I love it. I'm just like not because I remember, like I said, I'm seeing bits and pieces of it. And I thought that that is such a strong way to think about it. And I think for so many people, it'll help shift their perspective. Because like you said, so many people are waiting. Just tell me what you want. <laughs> right. They're waiting yeah. for other people to do it for them and not recognizing that it's really up to them to stand up. Right. So from my perspective or the way in which I approach it, I talk about self-leadership. I talk about building those win-win opportunities. Right. That's what a CEO does. What do they want? What do I want? Where is that overlap? I love it. I absolutely love now, it. Now, here's the thing. You know, you ask any entrepreneur, any business leader, any freelance, big or small, successful or unsuccessful, you know, what are the three biggest challenges, the three biggest, you know, chunks that you have to deal with? And you're smiling because, I, I mean, you already feel it on your skin. What is it? It's, in my mind, three things. Number one, the uncertainty. You yeah. just don't know what's going to happen. You don't have, you know, the expected salary for the year. You don't know what's going to happen next month, dealing with the uncertainty. Number two, um, patience. You know, there's a reason Gary Vaynerchuk and all the, I mean, they talk about patience because what you want to get next month is not what you want to get five years. And for the five years, you need a lot of patience. Nothing good comes easy and all that. But it's easy to say, hard thing to to deal with every day. Yeah. So uncertainty, patience, and the big one for me is the loneliness. No one is there with you to sell up to 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 um, you know feel sorry for the losses or get mad at the losses. No one is there with you to celebrate the wins. And even if you have partners, they're not with you in between your ears. At the end of the day, it's a very lonely journey as an entrepreneur, which means as a business unit, if you are the CEO of you. There's a certain amount of loneliness you're just going to have to get um, get used to. Fair. Wait. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on like things that people can do or routines they can build to help sort of work through the loneliness, work through the impatience, or even work through, you know, the uncertainty? Um, yes. I mean, there's not a, you know, one size fits all solution, okay. but different things help different people. I'm a big believer in the cowboy town. Uh, um, analogy. So, you know, if you think of like the imaginary cowboy town from, you know, 200 years ago or whatever, in the middle of the desert in California or Peru or what have you, um, you know, everybody wants to look for gold. So everybody competes with everyone. So you go into the cowboy town on your journey to, to get the kaching and dig the mountain or whatever, Maybe you want to do this. Like you don't want to tell anybody that you sure. think you know where the goal is. And I think it's a huge mistake. This is the biggest loneliness ever. Yeah. And, and this happens to corporate employees uh, who think that it's a zero sum game. It happens to entrepreneurs who don't want to share their idea with the other entrepreneur, whatever. Um, I'm a big, this is why I hate poker, poker. I hate this. If you put me on a poker table, the first thing I do is this. So I'm a big believer in this. The more you talk openly um, with others, um, it helps. The question is, who are the effective others? So there's a lot of wisdom on that, on how to build your business community, how to find givers and not takers. We talk about Adam Grant, um, how to communicate your why. We talk about Simon Sinek. So there's a lot of wisdom out there. Um, make it a habit to actually use those tips when you communicate. I love that. Yeah. So, so recognizing that you should share. And I agree. I do think one of the things that could make being an entrepreneur or employee trying to, you know, climb up this career ladder is feeling like you can't share, right? That the pie is this fixed thing and that, you know, you want a piece yeah. of it. And so that, therefore you can't give anyone else access. Right. I mean, back to the cowboy in the cowboy town, what did the smart cowboy do? Maybe try to dig a few hills, but go into the saloon start getting to know the people in the town. All of them want to find gold, but this guy opened the bar. You know, this guy has a stable, you know, she's running a hotel. It's the cowboy town. It's a community. Get blended in the community, gain trust and, you know, um, acceptance and, you know, make people trust you and accept you. And then maybe will someone will take you in the right exhibition to find gold. Yeah. So put yourself in a position to get lucky as many people say it. 
I love that. Yeah. And I think also that can be strategic as well, right? So who are you surrounding yourself with? Who are you connected to? How can you leverage your network? Definitely. I love Absolutely. That. Yeah. But I want to flip it now a little bit. Okay. And I'm ready. I'm happy to ask you about your story and yeah. then get how do you see things. But for, for the people who may watch this and don't know who you are, uh, I'd be happy for you to share your story. Definitely. I always love to start off with my name. I always spell it out. So it's A-K-U-A. And the reason why I do this is because I think it gives people an, like an idea really of sort of why I do what I do in some ways. So my father is Ghanaian. So he usually, usually calls me Ikfia. My mom is American. She says Akua. And for a lot of my life, I grew up in French speaking West Africa, finished high school in North Africa. And then I guess now as an adult, I spent you know, about five years in Nigeria and they typically refer to me as Aqua. So I think one of the first things to sort of keep in mind about the work I do and the things that I really enjoy and sort of value, it's diversity. I love being around different people. I love having conversations like this. And I love being able to incorporate different things to build something really new. Um, so what do I do? I, I typically talk about myself as an executive and leadership coach. And I think with that, it just means that I love working with people who consider themselves leaders. Either they're leading themselves or are leading others. You know, they have some sort of resources that they have control over or influence over or looking to guide, I think, at the end of the day. I would say that typically I focus a lot at the end of the day on productivity. So I get a lot of people coming to me talking about time scarcity. I don't have time to coach and mentor, right? I don't have time to take a break. I don't have time to do X, Y, and Z. I don't have time to work out. So a lot of times I'm talking about, you know, helping leaders focus so that they can connect to scale. Because for me, I remember when I had the opportunity to work for a fast growing startup, the hardest part of my work was connecting with others, right? The hardest part of my work wasn't necessarily figuring out what to get done. Really good at productivity. Goal setting is my jam. I love that sort of stuff. It comes to me naturally and I love helping other people figure out what works for them as well. Because once again, one size definitely does not fit all in terms of productivity. But the part I had the hardest with was building my self-awareness. So I knew how to build those one-on-one you know, one -on sort of relationships, networking, um, learning how to build those win-win you know, opportunities, right? And so for me, I love working with leaders to support them in that way. So they feel comfortable being able to really step up into their position so they can delegate, they can feel like they can mentor and they have the space and time to do that as well. So yeah, that's kind so, of what- So wait, I'm interested. So, so you work for a fast growing startup and you, you were, um, had a hard time you know, uh, with uh, that and part. And at what point you understood that getting it right is, is you know, that's one way, but- your thing is to help others get it right. Like when was the point when that hit you? Yeah. So when, you know, when I first started off, you know, I was employee sort of number one and just really recognizing I couldn't do it by myself. So a lot of it was like hitting that wall and being like, okay, this way of operating is not going to scale. Um, that's sort of how I guess I thought about it in the startup space. Other people might think about it like, oh, wait, <laughs> this is overwhelming. Oh, wait, I can't take a break. I have to work all night. So you just recognize that you hit a wall and something has to change. So for me, I worked for this particular startup for about four years. And then the platforms I was in charge of, so it was an online business, they were sold to competitors. So I didn't have anything else to do, left that company and sort of took a bit of a break. Um, but prior to that, I had already been introduced to coaching as a way to build rapport. Uh, so a lot of my interest in working in the leadership space comes from feeling very alone and comes from a lot of the mistakes I made as a leader, both building my own team and taking over somebody else's. So for me, you know, I joined the sort of fast forward through it. I joined another company for a short period of time. It wasn't a good fit. And so after I left that company, I hadn't had, I hadn't decided what to do. I just knew that wasn't a good fit for me. And so I had spent time and money and energy into a coaching certification. And I was like, well, let me think about what it would take to build a coaching business. And so that's really what I've been doing for the last two years. I very much thought to myself, like, I don't want anybody else to feel alone like I did. You know, if someone can help jumpstart or leapfrog somebody, why not do that? Why not be able to be the one to create the space so people can do that? So that's really where it went from. I can do it myself, right? Because that's what I thought, like, I'll just take all these coaching and mentorship and all this training stuff and do it for businesses who are paying me to like build teams, or I can create a space for other people to feel comfortable so they can build the skills and then take it back to their own businesses. I can totally identify with the falling in love and serving others. So that's, uh, yeah, I can totally identify with that. It has to do with the work I do with young professionals as well. But then you started doing these interviews like we're doing right now. Yeah. Because um, we met on Lunch Club, but you also run these interviews regardless. 
when did you start doing them? I'm interested. And yeah. Why? So I started doing the interviews last year. So about a year or so into actually starting this journey of building my own coaching practice. And these interviews came at a point where I recognized once again that I'd hit a wall, right? I very much have found, and I mean, I'm sure to a lot of people, this is going to sound super cliche, but I've always found that I tend to get the best results. I tend to get the most clients. I tend to get the most opportunities when I'm just willing to go just a little bit further away from my comfort zone. And I recognize that I was very comfortable having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, very comfortable, maybe writing a blog post, but I wasn't comfortable on camera. I wasn't comfortable on video. I wasn't comfortable interviewing. And so initially it very much was about how can I get comfortable doing this? And so I thought, why not try uh, to do interviews where I'm creating a space for us to have a conversation where I'm learning more about this individual, where they're learning more about me and I can share it with other people. I then took it a step further to say like, I would not edit unless the person I was interviewing decided they wanted it to be edited. So it very much, right? So first of all and foremost, it needs to be recorded. The video needs to be on. I don't want to edit it, you know, and I want to put it out there. So it very much is just a, initially an exercise in sort of trying to get past my comfort zone, but it quickly became an opportunity for me just to learn a little bit more about people's stories and then recognize that so many people can learn from other people's stories. And I just enjoy, and for me, I think one of the biggest things I've learned through my journey of being a coach and just growing up, because I grew up once again in such diverse like situations where it was celebrated to have something different about you or be unique in some way or have this own idea of what success looks like. And I wanted to sort of bring that back into my life because I'm not in such diverse environments anymore. And now the, you know, the, the question must be asked. So what, what would you say uh, the things you learned the most from these interviews? First and foremost, I would say that everyone has a unique journey and I love it. I love hearing where people started and the fact that what they initially thought they were going to do isn't necessarily what they're going to do now. And I think it's incredibly powerful to, to hear that and be able to share that with other people. So everyone's journey is unique. Um, I think the second thing is that really connects all the different interviews is this idea of people wanting to have an impact. And I love it, right? So you talk about how you wanted to have an impact and you first thought the way to have an impact was through, you know, being a leader in a political sort of sphere. And then you've recognized that it's through private enterprise, through being through startups, you can also have an impact. And I love hearing how different people have different perspectives, but at the end of the day, it's all about building something bigger than themselves. It's all about having an impact beyond themselves. And I really love that. And I love how people can share it from their perspective as well. And my hope is that it opens people's eyes once again to other ways of being able to have an impact. And I think the last thing is just this idea of what would be the right word or the right way to put it. I, I would say the last thing that I've really enjoyed about these interviews is just connecting, I think, with, with people as well. I think all of us are a lot more alike than we like to believe in some ways, right? Which is a weird thing for a coach to say, because as much as I appreciate how different we are, and a lot of my work is about helping people become comfortable with sharing and incorporating their differences, we also are very much alike. So I, I love sort of that, that push and pull, that dynamic between recognizing like, oh, that's a really unique way to put it. And oh, that is so similar to this at the same time. Oh, this really worked for me. That's amazing. Oh, this sort of thing worked for me. So I would say it's, it's the, the saloon in the cowboy town. Yes, exactly. Those sorts of things. So we are different, but at the same time, there is so much that also connects us. I love it. So you know what? I, I, one last question that I have to ask, because, you know, a lot of I see a lot of coaches and personal trainers, you know, they talk to the individual. And, and again, I do that too. I'm not a professional coach, but you know, when I talk to young professionals, I talk to them, not their employers. But I'm kind of interested also in the work that you do with businesses, with, with companies. So it's a new world of work. There are new rules to the game. The definition of what is work, what is a career, that's changing. The very, you know, the very description of the roles that we have in the organization may not stick around next year. We'll have to change them all together. So the constants become variable. I'm interested in the variables that become constant. As someone that works with companies, what do you find yourself communicating more and more to company leaders as a better way to work in today's work environment and empower their employees and their teams? Oh, such a good question. 
Um, so with my B2B work, I'm typically talking about productivity. And I would say the thing that um, really tends to resonate or a lot of leaders are starting to recognize is that productivity isn't about working more. It's about taking the time that you decide to work and using it to the best of your ability. So I end up talking a lot around um, this idea. I love to talk about like mindfulness and being present and just really recognizing that, yes, you know, we might set aside eight hours of work for work every single day. Do we really do eight hours of work? No. But how do we make sure the four hours or the three hours, or the four hours that we work, we're being able to produce the best results? So that's a lot of the conversations I'm having. I'm also talking a lot about resilience as well. And so I think that, you know, companies are becoming aware of how important it is for them to actually have conversations around and create space for their employees to recognize that there is more than just being able to produce work. They have to worry about their emotional intelligence. They need to be thinking about, you know, how do they feel, um, you know, their, you know, physically, mentally, emotional. There are all these different components that are necessary to keep in mind, especially right now where a lot of us aren't having the space or the opportunity to go outside, right? We can't work the same way we worked previously. And so some of those things and incorporating some of those things is becoming even more important. So I think yeah, talking I mean, about those things. For the people who may watch this 10 years from now, the reason I put this in the beginning is because <laughs> we're in 2021, which is still in the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to make that clear. Exactly. But no, but that that's really it, right? They're recognizing. And I think that that has always been sort of there. There's always been that challenge, but I think people had more tools and techniques. They could remove themselves, I think, in different ways where you can't do that now, right? Where we work is where we live for the most part right now. So how can we make sure that we're able to show up as our best selves with the time that we allocate? It's by making sure we're checking in with ourselves, you know, building those routines, building those rituals beyond just doing work. That's actually what's gonna allow you to show up as your best self and the best employee <laughs> when you're good out in those other areas too. Words of wisdom. Yeah. All right. Any any other questions for me? Um, how can people reach out to you? Because they're going to watch it and they're going to say, I, I must reach out to Akua. So how can they do that? Great question. I would say the best way is probably to find me on LinkedIn. So just sort of search my name. So it's AKUA. You can just do AKUANM. So that's part of my last name. And I think you'll be able to find me on uh, on LinkedIn. Yeah. Can I ask you another question before I ask for people sure. who find you? I'm really curious. What are you super excited about this year? What am I super excited about this year? So first of all, when you say this year, I kind of count from March, which is when COVID started, March 2020. So the like the year is about to end. We've been almost a year into COVID. So Fair. I'm kind of looking at this this way. Um, you know, there's the saying that you know, a good crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And um, which is a cliche, but the reason it's a cliche is because it probably has a big mass of truth. So what gets me excited is, you know, are there moves that, that are the strategic moves that I'm making? And, you know, some are public, some are not. Um, are they going to play out for the long term? I'm a big, big believer. And always, you know, thinking in three layers, long-term, mid-term, and short-term, just like a business plan, because we're all businesses. So like, what do you want to happen in the next two months, in the next six months, in the next, or the next five years, in the next 10 years? So like really different timescales. What gets me excited? Are the moves that I'm doing, are they going to play out in the short, mid, and long-term, especially the long-terms? I am not that good in short-term thinking mm -hmm. i'm a big believer in long-term thinking which has good and bad but i'm a, I'm a long-term person whether it comes to you know what kind of running i do or you know what kind of thinking i do so long-term gotcha all right and how can people find you look me up online and mainly i am interested in people's opinions about the idea of thinking like a business unit because i'm a student of the desert just like anybody else uh, so i'm happy to have conversations around it i learn from everyone and especially from people like you so i want to thank you so much for having me yeah thank you so much this was a lot of fun i mean i knew it was going to be fun but this was a ton of fun so thank you so much for your time for your energy and for your thoughts you too Thank All you right. so much. Bye.